Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Rosalind Plotzker. I'm a faculty member for the California Prevention Training Center, and it is my great pleasure to host the STI Clinical Update webinar. Our webinar topic today is neurosyphilis. We have a neurosyphilis update that will be presented by Drs. Kathy Jacobson and Sue Tuttingham. Um, a little bit about the CAPTC first. We are a multidisciplinary training center and we also do capacity building assistance. Um, we're sponsored by the CDC and we're a member of the national network of STD clinical prevention training centers, which are eight different training centers similar to our own throughout the country. We provide both virtual and in-person events as well as technical assistance and we create clinical tools and do STI clinical consultation services. If you wanna learn more about NNPTC or CAPTC, you can see our websites listed below. Um, we host the STD Clinical Consultation Network, which is stdccn.org. If you ever have a tough STD question or a complex STD um, clinical scenario, you're welcome to reach out to us for that. Here's our financial disclosure for today's webinar. And here is our CME disclosure. These slides will be available later for reference if you want to refer back to these. For CME requirements today, we have 1.5 CME requirements. In order to obtain these, you need to be first registered for the webinar via NNPTC by yesterday. Um, so unfortunately, registration is now closed. If you have registered as of yesterday, then you're eligible for CME. The webinar must be watched live and in full, so please stick with us for the whole thing. Um, your attendance is going to be recorded as you sign on and you'll need to complete a post-course survey evaluation, and that will need to be done by July 29th, 2022 this year. Um, <clears throat> if you've registered for the webinar as above, then you'll receive an email notification within 24 hours after this webinar. You can see the email address is training at nnptc.org, and there'll be a link to complete that post-survey. Um, and to ensure that you do receive this notification, you can either add that email or you can check your spam and junk folders if you don't see it within 24 hours. In terms of processing, we always get questions about this. The CME provider is University of Nevada, Reno. And if you meet CME requirements, you will receive an email notification from us, CAPTC, within four to six weeks from the post course survey deadline, okay? Um, and that email notification is sent to the email address that you use to register for this webinar. Okay, a couple housekeeping things for our webinar before I introduce our speakers. Uh, for questions and answers, the Q&A will be turned on during the webinar and you'll see an icon, um, which is these two little speech bubbles and Q&A at the bottom. That's from your Zoom tools, and you can open that in the Q&A chat window. Okay, you type your question and then you click send. Attendees can submit questions up until the last two minutes of the Q&A section, so this will be open. The questions can be answered by webinar panelists, either directly at the chat window or live at the end during our Q&A session. Chat speaker, microphone, and video will be turned off during the webinar for attendees. If you have any questions about CAPTC, about today's webinar, please uh, reach out to Elizabeth Olson. She's our clinical program manager, and her address is Elizabeth Olson at uh, ucsf.edu. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Kathleen Jacobson is the chief of the STD control branch, and she has been closely involved in the COVID-19 response and is the senior clinical advisor to the California Testing Task Force. Just prior to joining CDPH, Dr. Jacobson was the senior HIV and TB care and treatment advisor to the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention for the country of Uganda. Dr. Jacobson is an associate professor of clinical medicine at the UC at USC, excuse me, Keck School of Medicine for the past 20 years, where she directed three medical school courses, was a principal investigator on a number of multi-site studies, 
and the medical director of the LA Region AIDS Education and Training Center, or AETC, for those of you who are familiar with that. Dr. Jacobson has more than 25 years of clinical experience and has trained a few thousand providers in clinical care. So welcome, Dr. Jacobson. Susan Tuttingham um, is an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins. Her clinical interests are in sexually transmitted and urogenital infections, and she heads a joint ID OBGYN clinic for women with recurrent infectious vaginitis and recurrent UTIs or urinary tract infections. She served as a subject matter expert for adult syphilis for the 2021 CDC STI treatment guidelines and is a member of the bacterial enteric infections group of the DHHS guidelines for the prevention and treatment of opportunistic infections in adults and adolescents with HIV. Dr. Tuttingham's research interests are in STIs and the role of the human microbiome in susceptibility to and pathogenesis of STIs, HIV, and neurogenital infections. And we're very lucky to have them both. Again, here are the CME requirements. Um, just a brief reminder. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dr. Jacobson. So Dr. Jacobson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ross. Give me one moment to pull up my slides. All right, so thank you, Roz, for the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, Sue and I are both really excited to uh, give er everyone this presentation today on neuroocular and otic syphilis updates. Let's see, there we go. Today's learning objectives will include discussing the national and local California epidemiology of syphilis, neurosyphilis, ocular, and otic syphilis. Describe the pathophysiology of neuroocular and otic syphilis and delineate the clinical diagnosis and management of patients with neuroocular and otic syphilis. As all of you are well aware, STDs are on the rise in the United States uh, with over 133,000 cases of syphilis that occurred in 2020, and that was a 52% increase since 2016. And generally speaking, the rising uh, STD cases has been further impacted by the COVID uh, pandemic. And these trends continued into 2021, where, where we saw continued increases in primary and secondary syphilis, uh, with men who make up roughly uh, four times the number of cases of women, men's uh, cases went up 9%, but women's cases went up 34%. And there's a downstream effect when women are uh, infected with syphilis uh, with a risk for congenital syphilis. And congenital syphilis cases went up 6% in 2021 compared to 2022. And what about the national epidemiology of neuroocular and otic syphilis? There's been two recent studies, this one by DeVoe, which showed an overall prevalence of neurosyphilis that was relatively low at 0.84% from 20, or 2009 to 2015. However, they commented that it's very difficult to track, that it's underdiagnosed and underreported, and that there's an overall lack of reporting of neurosyphilis. And then this study, which uh, came out just last week in preprint, um, showed roughly 1% of neuro or ocular uh, syphilis amongst syphilis cases in 16 states across the US and very low uh, cases of otic syphilis at 0.4%. But it also commented that this prevalence was overall low among syphilis cases, 
but that these data are likely an underestimate given the potential underreporting that happens for neurosyphilis. Uh, the reported clinical manifestations amongst both HIV positive and HIV negative uh, individuals emphasize the importance of evaluating all syphilis cases for signs and symptoms for neuroocular and otic syphilis. And what about California's syphilis cases? Well, if you look across time from uh, really 1940s to recent, you can see that California's incidence rates either mirror or proceed uh, what happens across the US. And of significance is in 2019, when California's primary and secondary syphilis incidence rates were two times the rates of the rest of the US. And when we uh, look at, at uh, the gender breakdown for primary and secondary syphilis in California, we see that similar to the rest of the US, males make up roughly uh, four times the number of cases of females in California. And looking at syphilis incidents across time from 1990 to 2019 in California, California hit an all time low around the year 2000, during which most of the syphilis cases were late or unknown duration syphilis. But then gradually we began to see an increase first in uh, uh, primary and secondary syphilis, and then uh, uh, unknown primary and secondary syphilis. And that gradually increased over time with late unknown syphilis um, following shortly thereafter. And then around 2014, 15, we saw significant increases begin to happen in California. And if you look at the case counts on the left and uh, the case rates on the right, you can see the brunt of the epidemic is in Southern California and really uh, through the Central Valley of California. But when you look at the uh, incidence rates, you see that there's actually significantly high incidence rates also in some of the more Northern uh, counties in California that are some of the more rural and remote uh, counties in California. So the, if we look at, uh, surveillance for neuroocular and otic syphilis in California. It's really dependent on a few key things. The first is classifying a diagnosis of neurosyphilis relies on the patient reporting the symptoms and the provider conducting an evaluation for neurosyphilis at the time of the medical visit. This includes an assessment for neurologic symptoms and a thorough neuro exam with a uh, focus on vision, hearing, and cranial nerves, but actually a comprehensive neuro exam is important. Then the next step is accurately counting those neurosyphilis cases, which relies on all patients' uh, symptoms being accurately recorded at the time of the case report. And so when you all are making that case report, if you don't record those symptoms, we don't pick up on the fact that there's a neurosyphilis case there. In addition to that, a lot of uh, syphilis cases are initially reported electronically. So uh, there could be a significant gap um, because of this electronic reporting that occurs missing and not connecting those uh, morbidity reports with that electronic lab reporting. Further complicating the issue, neurosyphilis may not always be diagnosed in tandem with a new syphilis incidence. Someone may be diagnosed with syphilis today and six months, a year, two years down the road, they get diagnosed with neurosyphilis. And if those two are not connected, if a new uh, report is not open, then that case gets missed. So there's significant barriers to ensuring good uh, neuroocular and otic syphilis surveillance in California. Uh, despite this, we looked at what uh, the neurosyphilis cases look like over time and what percentage of neurosyphilis um, 
cases were to total cases uh, of syphilis in California. And the purple bars represent the neurosyphilis cases, and you can see those have increased over time. But the overall percent of neurosyphilis cases has remained relatively stable, around 2%. But again, because of the uh, previous uh, things that we talked about, it is possible that we are under-reporting neurosyphilis in California. And for ocular syphilis, we similarly, the purple bars represent uh, the ocular syphilis cases, and you can see that those have been on, our, on the rise. Um, and the percent of ocular uh, syphilis cases among all cases has seen a gradual increase, although it's possible some of that increase that we see that begins around 2014-15 was due to a change in the case definition. And so we picked up additional cases. So because of these questions about our ability to truly track neuroocular and otic syphilis in California, California is implementing new plans for um, its neuroocular and otic syphilis surveillance. We're currently in the process of transforming our surveillance case report form to enable capture of all signs and symptoms associated with neuroocular and otic syphilis to capture all lumbar puncture laboratory data that would potentially be associated with neurosyphilis and also utilizing an ELR automated surveillance process that uses a code to parse out the CSF uh, labs on uh, syphilis cases. Then we'll, we'll, run and, uh, we'll run our surveillance on a weekly basis and look for any cases that trigger as potential neuroocular or otic syphilis cases. And <clears throat> once we pull those cases out, then our clinical team will review those cases and either decide that they're confirmed neuroocular or otic syphilis or um, that they're probable or they're not a case. If confirmed or probable, they'll confirm that the patient um, has received adequate treatment and we hope that this will potentially improve a California's neuroocular and otic syphilis surveillance. And this really mirrors a process that we just um, did uh, to try to improve our ability to survey for DGI capture in California. All right, so enough on surveillance, let's talk about a case. So you're consulting at a new clinic, it's 5.30 p.m. The clinic closed at four and you just sat down to start writing your notes. The nursing assistant comes in and asks you if you'll see a patient. Of course you say yes. So this is a 29 year old female who presents complaining of eight out of 10 headache times three days. She also notes left eye pain and some redness in her eye and some photophobia. She has subjective fevers no nausea, vomiting, or loss of hearing or vision. She notes she has some sort of lesions on her labia for the last couple of days, but they're not really painful. She's a gravita two para one female. Uh, she had one live birth, her six-year-old girl who's in clinic with her today, and a spontaneous uh, abortion previously. Her previous medical history is significant for the fact that she's perinatally infected with HIV, She's not been on antiretroviral therapy. And the most recent CD4 count you can find in her chart is about four months old, and it's a CD4 of 19 and a viral load of 359,000. She's got no history of surgery, and her social history is significant for the fact that she uses methamphetamine. And when she's binging on methamphetamine, she often disappears for long periods of time. So on exam, you note this red eye. And then on her labia, you notice uh, multiple lesions that are ulcerative in nature. And if um, she had not told you these were painless or in, in describe these as being slightly painful or significantly painful, what would you likely think this is? This commonly gets uh, misdiagnosed in, as a suspected herpes case. Um, but we're seeing more and more of primary syphilis 
that presents with multiple ulcerations um, and can be sometimes painful, even though we tend to think of primary syphilis as having a single lesion that's well circumscribed with raised rubbery borders that's painless. This can sometimes present a little bit painful. And when you see this, even if you're thinking herpes, you should think syphilis. You wanna test for um, syphilis and consider empiric treatment for primary syphilis as well. So Sue, does this patient have syphilis? <laughs> Well, I think we certainly have to be very concerned for the possibility of syphilis and neuro and ocular syphilis as well in this patient. Um, so, but before we learn more about this really interesting case and what ends up happening, why don't we go back to basics for a moment and talk about the pathogenesis of neurosyphilis. So uh, we're gonna talk about neurosyphilis, ocular and otic syphilis. I think some would consider ocular and otic syphilis to be a subset of neurosyphilis, but they are somewhat distinct and some approaches may be different. So I'm gonna talk about them separately. Uh, but syphilis is caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum, as you're aware, it's a spirochete. Uh, you can see some of those little nice spiral organisms uh, in the dark field image up at the top of the slide. Uh, and it's a very tricky organism uh, because it can cause several different stages of disease in people, uh, as you can see laid out on this slide. Now, it's of course a sexually transmitted infection. So after exposure in the red there, uh, there's an incubation period. And then people can develop what's called primary syphilis, uh, which is what Kathy has been talking about right now. Um, in primary syphilis, people develop in ulcer or chancre. Uh, as she mentioned, classically, it's a single painless ulcer, but clinical presentation can be variable. And uh, we've seen, uh, certainly as with this patient, multiple ulcers, sometimes painful ulcers. Uh, so it's not always just that single painless ulcer. Now, even with antibiotics, even if the patient, uh, even without antibiotics, sorry, even if the patient does not get appropriately treated, usually the immune system will kick in locally and that ulcer will heal. But then in a certain percentage of patients, about two to six weeks later, um, they'll develop what's called secondary syphilis. And that's really representative in a patient who hasn't been treated for the primary syphilis of uh, the organism evading the immune system and disseminating to our, the other parts of the body. So you can have a multitude of manifestations uh, at this stage, um, depending on where those organisms are landing. People can have rashes on different parts of their body. Uh, they can have uh, systemic symptoms. They can have a hepatitis, so liver issues, a nephritis, uh, kidney issues. You name it, uh, really almost any organ system can be involved and there are a multitude of different manifestations. Um, now, even without antibiotics, so even if they're not identified and treated at that stage, most people's immune system will again kick in, control the infection, and then the patient will go into what's called latent syphilis. So latent, of course, means that they have the infection, but their immune system is controlling it, uh, so they don't have any signs or symptoms of syphilis. And we divide latent into early latent, which was acquired within the last year and can sometimes relapse into secondary syphilis or late latent, which was acquired more than a year ago. And remember that primary and secondary syphilis are considered sexually transmissible. That latent phase and thereafter really isn't, um, but vertical transmission, so from mother to baby can occur, or mother to fetus, I should say, can really occur um, with any stage. But anyway, dealing with latent syphilis, uh, People who have latent syphilis, actually the majority of them will go on their merry way and never have another problem with syphilis that they know of as long as they live because they'll have the infection, but their immune system is controlling it. And so they'll never have any signs or symptoms. But if left untreated, uh, unfortunately, a certain proportion of people, even decades later, may develop what's called tertiary syphilis. And that can manifest as cardiovascular syphilis. So commonly, uh, for example, people can develop aortic aneurysms, which can rupture and cause death. Uh, gummatous syphilis, where people can have gummas or benign tumors that appear in different parts of the body. And then certainly as part of tertiary syphilis, you can have late neurosyphilis or late ocular or otic syphilis. Now it's important to remember that although neurosyphilis, ocular and otic syphilis can be a manifestation of tertiary syphilis, uh, neurosyphilis, ocular and otic syphilis can actually occur at any stage of syphilis. So you can also see that from the, uh, the bars there in 
this figure. And neurosyphilis, ocular and otic syphilis can even be the first manifestation of, uh, of syphilis. So that's really important to remember. Um, early neurosyphilis does tend to manifest a little bit differently than late neurosyphilis. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, now, one more note, uh, diagnosis of syphilis, as I'm sure you're all aware, is very difficult and very confusing. And uh, part of the issue is that most of the time you're not able to directly detect the organism. So if you have an appropriate lesion in primary or secondary syphilis and you have access to a dark field microscope, you can do a scraping and look at it and you can see those organisms um, that there's a nice picture of um, in the upper part of the slide. There are sometimes some sort of homegrown PCRs that can be done as well. But most of the time you're relying on clinical diagnosis, um, your exam, and then on serologies to confirm the diagnosis. And serologies are not directly detecting the organism, they're really detecting the body's immune response to the infection, so antibodies. So it's sort of a secondary way of looking at it and therein lies a lot of confusion and difficulty. So diagnosing uh, syphilis, including neuroocular and otic syphilis is often uh, a challenge. So let's move on to the next slide. All right, so a little bit more about the pathophysiology of neurosyphilis. And this is another uh, figure very similar to the one on the other slide that shows the different stages of syphilis, but maybe a little more detail in terms of neurosyphilis. So Treponema pallidum, this organism is amazing. It has this incredible ability to spread systemically and can even be found within the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF within hours to days after exposure. So that really explains why neurologic complications can occur actually very early and at any stage of the infection. Um, now, a certain percentage of people who have uh, essentially the organism found in the CSF will be asymptomatic but others will develop symptoms of, uh, will develop neurologic symptoms or ocular or otic symptoms and be diagnosed with neurosyphilis, ocular or otic syphilis. Now, early neurosyphilis is uh, really representative of inflammation occurring in the meninges and the associated vasculature. And it can manifest as syphilitic meningitis. So patients can complain of a headache, it can be a relatively subtle headache actually. Um, they can have cranial nerve abnormalities. And then uh, the treponemes really like to go and hang out in the vascular endothelial cells and cause a lot of inflammation. And when there's a great deal of inflammation essentially in the blood vessel wall, you can get a uh, blockage or occlusion of the blood vessels, including very tiny blood vessels. And eventually that can lead to ischemia. So uh, early neuro neurosyphilis can also manifest as meningovascular syphilis that basically shows up as strokes. Late neurosyphilis is uh, a, a result of chronic inflammation and uh, can manifest classically as general paresis, um, which shows up as dementia or personality changes. Um, it can also manifest as uh, tabes dorsalis. Um, so that's really representative of uh, degeneration of the posterior columns of the spinal cord and patients can have difficulty with gait. Um, they can have proprioception abnormalities. Uh, they can have something uh, that's described as lancinating pains. So these really very sharp sort of lightning like pains that can go uh, down their leg or, or other locations. Sometimes they can have some GI upset and other abnormalities. Um, now, late neurosyphilis, like early neurosyphilis, can also manifest as meningovascular uh, syphilis, so you can have strokes, and can manifest as a meningomyelitis, so patients can present with a hemiparesis or um, symptoms consistent with a transverse myelitis. So really a lot of different manifestations here. Next slide. So what about uh, the pathophysiology of ocular and otic syphilis? Well, I think the most important thing to know about ocular syphilis is that any part of the eye can be involved at any time, at any stage of syphilis. So there's no one pathognomonic sign or symptom. Uh, so you can't say, okay, this is definitely representative of ocular syphilis. And uh, by the same token, you can't take any ocular abnormality and be absolutely certain it's not representative of ocular syphilis uh, just by looking at it. So um, oftentimes ocular syphilis is uh, a diagnosis of exclusion, though if you suspect it um, and there's a gray area, you're not certain, it's probably best to err on the side of treating because not treating can have devastating consequences. 
Um, anterior uveitis, which is inflammation of the middle layer of the eye, the iris and the adjacent ciliary body is pretty common in early syphilis, maybe one of the most common manifestations. And then optic nerve atrophy, chorioretinitis, those kinds of abnormalities are perhaps more common in late syphilis. But again, any part of the eye can be involved at any time. Uh, so that's important to remember. Otic syphilis uh, manifests as cochlear vestibular abnormalities. And so again, patients can uh, uh, present with hearing loss or tinnitus or ringing in the ears. Next slide. So, uh, uh, back. <laughs> okay, so this gets to, I think, our most important take home message and what we really want to impress on you and why we wanted to do this talk in the first place. Uh, I think you've seen, and I hope you've been convinced by all those great epidemiology slides that Dr. Jacobson shared that uh, syphilis is on the rise and unfortunately with it, neuro, ocular and otic syphilis. So if you haven't seen this yet, or if you haven't seen more of this yet, you likely will, but it's critical not to miss it because the, the, the consequences of missing it can be devastating. So neuro syphilis, of course, uh, can be life-threatening and can lead to permanent deficits. Ocular syphilis can lead to permanent blindness or other deficits. And people can actually develop permanent blindness very quickly. Um, so they can go and actually progress within hours to days. Uh, so ocular syphilis is really an emergency. You need to evaluate it and treat it right away. And then otic syphilis similarly, if untreated, can lead to uh, long-term deficits. So please uh, ask about neurologic, ocular, or otic symptoms in all patients with syphilis or those you strongly suspect of having syphilis, like this individual. Um, and for neurologic, you, want, you might want to ask about things like headaches, new onset weakness, problems with walking, difficulty with memory or confusion, personality changes. For ocular, ask about things like change or blurring in vision, flashing lights, floaters, pain, redness. Otic, ask about hearing loss, tinnitus, those kinds of things. Uh, and certainly perform a brief neurologic exam in all patients who have syphilis. So you can try to elicit uh, some of those things that might be a little more subtle. Next slide. Okay, so back to you, Dr. Jacobson. All right, thanks, Sue. So um, you send the patient to the emergency room for a CT of her head, a lumbar puncture, and you call the ED doc to explain your suspicion. You wanna give her an injection of penicillin before she goes, just to give her some coverage in case she doesn't go to the ED, but also because you have high suspicion for uh, primary syphilis here as well. Uh, note that this single injection of uh, penicillin would not be adequate therapy to treat neuro or ocular syphilis, but you find out that the clinic doesn't have any. There we go, sorry, <laughs> took a moment for that to come up. Um, once the patient has left, you make your, you fill out your uh, morbidity report and uh, make a referral to public health. So at the emergency department, the patient has a CT of the head, but she leaves against medical advice before getting any labs, lumbar puncture, eye exam, or any antibiotics. The nurse tries to call her to return to the ED or at least come back to clinic. She doesn't respond. And then after a week of trying to reach the patient, the nurses reach her partner who tell you that she's on a um, uh, methamphetamine binge again, and she's disappeared for the last week. When she returns to your clinic two weeks later, again, 5.45 PM, she has increased headache and photophobia that's so severe that she's literally lying like this in your clinic. Um, with her face down to try to avoid the light in the room. On exam, you notice a pupil that accommodates to light but does not react. Uh, while you're examining the patient, her partner chimes in and notes that he has also now developed a lesion on his penis. So remember back to medical school, that infamous Argyle Robertson pupil, the, the sort of, uh, a subject of many board exam questions? Well, here's why. Um, so as you recall, um, for an Argyle Robertson pupil, individuals, when you bring your finger towards their uh, nose, their eyes will accommodate, they'll, they'll look at that finger. But if you bring a light in from the side, the pupils are already a bit constricted 
And when the light comes in, the pupils do not constrict, so they don't react to light. Um, this is pathognomonic for neurosyphilis. So even though it's affecting the eyes, this is really neurosyphilis. And it's damage to either the intercalated neuron in the midbrain, or it's damage to the inhibitory fibers to the ocular motor uh, neurons. And so really important to look for this. It's a rare finding, but when you find it, very pathognomonic for neurosyphilis. And when you see the partner, he does have that classic single um, ulceration uh, that was painless. As you can see here, there's some uh, raised rubbery borders associated with that, but he could have very well presented much like his partner with the multiple lesions, which may or may not have been painful. And this is now classic for uh, primary syphilis and both he and his partner need an injection of uh, penicillin for this. So you again tell the patient she needs to go to the emergency room. She may lose her sight if she doesn't. She and her partner both agree to getting a dose of bicillin. And again, you wanna treat this primary syphilis, but also you're concerned about her leaving AMA again, so you wanna get some penicillin on board. And as a reminder, this single dose is not gonna be adequate treatment for neuro or ocular syphilis. The nurse brings you the bicillin box and you notice that there's something wrong with it. She brings you this one here on the left, the bicillin CR. Well, it turns out bicillin CR has 600,000 units of uh, the shorter acting uh, bicillin in it, plus 600,000 units of the longer acting bicillin. What you really want is the bicillin LA standing for longer acting. And many clinics have made this error where they've purchased the shorter acting bicillin and then ultimately end up inadequately treating patients. And so really important that you help make sure that your clinic, when they're purchasing bicillin, get the long acting bicillin. And you can see even the syringes, they look exactly the same. And it's only the CR or LR or LA that's gonna tell you the difference between the two. So you're back to the emergency department. Um, you write a note and you call the ED docs with explicit plans, again, to draw syphilis serologies, call ophthalmology, begin empiric IV penicillin, and do a lumbar puncture. The clinic agrees to order the correct penicillin G long acting, which will be here tomorrow, and the partner agrees to uh, come in tomorrow to get his shot. A little bit later in the evening, you call the ED doc just to check in on the patient. The patient went to the ED, but sure enough, left against medical advice before any blood was drawn, LP or antibiotics given. The nurse and case manager attempt to call the patient into clinic multiple times, but she doesn't answer. Finally, you're able to reach her and you strongly urge her to go back to the ED again. Sue, okay. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, so I think we are trying very, very, very hard to make a diagnosis of neurocular syphilis, uh, but uh, have not been successful so far for a variety of reasons. Um, but let's talk about, ideally, if we were going to diagnose neurosyphilis and ocular syphilis, which we're certainly very concerned about in this patient, how would you do it? Well, I think the first thing to know is that uh, our diagnostics for neurosyphilis, unfortunately, as for syphilis in general, are not great. So generally one single test can't diagnose uh, neurosyphilis and we're really relying on a combination of neurologic signs and symptoms, um, consistent serologies. Though remember that uh, a proportion uh, of patients with late neurosyphilis might have a non-reactive RPR, though at that point the trepanemal test really should be positive. Also remember, we'll talk about this in more detail in a few slides, but very early on in uh, primary syphilis, it's possible that the antibodies just haven't had a chance to develop yet. So you can have a false negative uh, treponemal and non-treponemal test very early on. But by and large, you need consistent serologies and then the CSF. Uh, so I can't emphasize enough, if you are concerned about the possibility of neurosyphilis, the patient needs a lumbar puncture. 
Um, so an LP is really necessary uh, to help you make the diagnosis and you wanna examine the CSF. So what parameters are you looking for in the CSF to help you diagnose neurosyphilis? Again, in the right uh, clinical setting with uh, neurologic signs and symptoms and consistent serologies. Well, the VDRL um, is often sent and should be sent. Um, that's the equivalent uh, to the RPR in the serum. It's a non-treponemal test. And it is highly sensitive, but only about 50% specific. So if it is positive, it's very helpful. It will essentially clinch the diagnosis of neurosyphilis. But if it's negative, it does not rule out neurosyphilis. Um, so then if it is negative, you're gonna be looking at the other parameters. So first you'll be looking at the white blood cell count. And classically neurosyphilis manifests with a lymphocytic pleocytosis. Um, generally, you're not going to see a sort of the rip roaring, uh, you know, white blood cells and the multiple thousands that you might see with the, uh, a more standard bacterial meningitis, um, but you will see an elevation in white cells. Remember that in those with HIV, in particular those who have uncontrolled HIV, so who are not on ART, um, the CSF white blood cell counts can be elevated at baseline. And so Using a cutoff of greater than 20 rather than greater than five cells may improve specificity, but you really want to be careful about that, uh, especially you know, if a patient's actually well-controlled, um, that may not apply so much. Then, um, if, uh, th then the other factor you're going to look at is elevated protein. Uh, this isn't terribly specific, but certainly if there's an abnormality there, you're going to have concern. The CSF FTA is sometimes sent, um, but it sort of has the opposite issues in terms of uh, test parameters compared to the VDRL. So the CSF FTA is highly sensitive, but it's not specific. So if it's negative, it's helpful, but if it's positive, it's not all that helpful. So really critical to diagnosis of neurosyphilis is getting the CSF. Now a normal CSF generally rules out neurosyphilis. A normal CSF generally rules out neuros neurosyphilis. Though um, there is always a caveat, and about 10% of TABES dorsalis can present uh, with what's called burned out TABES that has a normal CSF. So that is possible, but that's, uh, TABES is already very uncommon, and that's a small percentage of those cases. For, so for most, uh, for most purposes, a normal CSF does generally rule out neurosyphilis. Next slide. So what about diagnosis of ocular and otic syphilis? Um, and uh, this is difficult as well. And as I mentioned before, it's often a diagnosis of exclusion. So for ocular syphilis, you're going to be looking for ocular symptoms, consistent serologies, though again, with the same caveats I mentioned earlier for neurosyphilis. And uh, then you're going to be looking for abnormalities on the ophthalmologic exam. And I really want to emphasize that it is critical if you suspect ocular syphilis this patient needs to have an exam with an ophthalmologist ASAP. So uh, not uh, five days from now, not two weeks from now, really within the next 24 hours, because there is concern. Some of these people can progress rapidly over hours to days to some permanent deficits, including blindness. Uh, and that may not be reversible uh, if it gets that far. So um, really you need an exam with an ophthalmologist and ideally, if it's possible, these patients can be co-managed with opto. What about the CSF? Um, so you can see the same CSF abnormalities as in neurosyphilis. So essentially they can have concomitant asymptomatic neurosyphilis, but nearly 40% of patients with ocular syphilis will have no CSF abnormalities at all. Um, so a negative CSF in contrast to neurosyphilis does not rule out ocular syphilis. And conversely, an LP or CSF, CSF exam is actually not required then for diagnosis of ocular syphilis. What about otic syphilis? Uh, so otic syphilis is really otic symptoms, um, hearing issues, tinnitus, and then consistent serologies, again, with the same caveats I talked about for neurosyphilis. And then really uh, finding abnormalities on ENT exam or testing. Um, oftentimes they'll need specialized testing with ENT, such as looking for sensory neural hearing loss. Um, and this really uh, ideally would be co-managed with ENT. What about the CSF? Uh, well, again, you can have the same abnormalities as are seen in neurosyphilis, but nearly 90% will have no CSF abnormalities. So if uh, a negative CSF doesn't rule out ocular syphilis. Well, it definitely doesn't rule out otic syphilis. And again, conversely, an LP or CSF exam is not required for diagnosis. And that's reflected 
in the 2021 CDC STI guidelines we'll talk about on the next slide. Next slide. So who needs an LP looking for neurosyphilis? Um, so absolutely, um, you need to perform a lumbar puncture in persons with syphilis um, who have neurologic signs and symptoms. No question, they need an LP. If a person has only isolated ocular or otic symptoms, a person with syphilis has only isolated ocular or otic symptoms and doesn't have neurologic signs or symptoms, an LP is actually not required. Though pay attention to things that are a little more subtle like cranial nerve dysfunction, patient might not complain specifically of uh, neurologic symptoms, but you might elicit that on exam. And then you certainly need an LP. You can consider an LP in those who have ocular symptoms with a reactive syphilis serology and no ocular findings on exam, because perhaps there's something else going on in the brain that is causing them to have a visual manifestation. Uh, so that's the main group of people we've really concentrated on so far, but there are a few other groups who are recommended in the CDC guidelines to have an LP looking for neurosyphilis. And those include patients who are diagnosed with tertiary syphilis, including cardiovascular or gummatous uh, tertiary syphilis. That's really because uh, there's a high percentage, about 30% of those patients who will be found to have asymptomatic neurosyphilis and therefore should be treated with IV penicillin. Uh, the standard treatment just for cardiovascular gummatus would be different and so that would change management. So it's recommended to get an LP in patients diagnosed with tertiary syphilis. Other groups uh, who are recommended for an LP or consideration for an LP include those in whom you suspect treatment failure. So patients uh, whose signs or symptoms persist or recur after treatment for syphilis or who have a sustained fourfold increase um, after appropriate treatment and an appropriate decline, um, who don't report ex sexual exposure. So basically, uh, you don't suspect that they've just been reinfected. Uh, those patients, again, you may suspect that perhaps they're having treatment failure and you want to do an LP looking for neurosyphilis to see if that's the reason why they haven't responded to their standard doses of IM penicillin. And then it can be considered um, to do an LP in those with lack of a fourfold decline in RPR titer um, who uh, don't have a sexual exposure, so no concern for reinfection in whom follow-up is uncertain. And I'll talk about that group a little more on, this, on the next slide. I'll note that there's no data currently to support routine LP in asymptomatic people with HIV who have syphilis. And it's not recommended in the guidelines, though we know that in people with HIV with syphilis, there's a small increased risk of asymptomatic neurosyphilis amongst those who have a low CD4 count, less than 350 cells, um, or an RPR titer of greater than or equal to one to 32. So some providers will consider an LP in those patients, um, and that's not an unreasonable approach but it's not required and not recommended um, per se in the guidelines. Next slide. Oh yeah, so let's, uh, let's focus in on these two groups because I think they're a little bit confusing with one more slide. Thanks, go ahead, next slide. So uh, LPs and uh, what to do uh, with RPR titers that are misbehaving essentially. Um, so the first group we talked about is those uh, who, in whom you suspect possible treatment failure. Um, so those who have a sustained fourfold increase in titers after appropriate therapy, if they have any neurologic signs or symptoms, of course, do an LP. That's no question. But if the patient could have been reinfected, then perhaps that's why their titer is going up. It's reasonable to treat them and then just follow to make sure that the RPR titer starts to behave itself. But if a patient denies the possibility of reinfection and the titer continues to be elevated when it's repeated two weeks later, certainly that's a time uh, to consider an LP because maybe they have neurosyphilis uh, and they're having treatment failure because of that. What about patients who are what we call serofast? Uh, so uh, I'll define that, there are different definitions, but I'll define that here as lack of a fourfold decline in RPR titers. So say going from one to 32 to one to eight after waiting a full 12 months following therapy for early syphilis and 24 months uh, following therapy for late syphilis. Um, so what to do with those patients? Well, if they have neurologic signs or symptoms, they should have an LP. If they could have been reinfected, then it's reasonable just to treat them uh, and, and follow them. If both of the above are negative though, you can either follow the patient carefully or you can give additional antibiotics and even consider an LP. Um, now I will say that about 10 to 20% of patients with primary syphilis will be serofast, meaning they won't have that appropriate fourfold decline in the first 12 months. And a certain proportion of those with later syphilis as well, that will occur. 
Um, and uh, so I think that uh, if you have a patient in whom follow-up is uncertain, um, or potentially one who starts out with a pretty high titer in latent syphilis, so greater than one to 32, um, then it's really reasonable to give them some more uh, penicillin, retreat them with three doses of benzathine penicillin G. Um, if uh, you think the follow-up is going to be uncertain, um, then certainly retreating them is reasonable. And you can also consider a CSF exam. Um, though, again, if you think you can follow them, it's also very reasonable just to follow them with serial exams and make sure nothing else happens. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Okay, back to you, Dr. Jacobson. So in the ED, the patient gets her blood drawn, a lumbar puncture performed, and the long-acting bicillin uh, given. She has an ophthalmology consult, and the ophthalmologist tells her she has conjunctivitis and not to worry about it. And based on that, the, the ED doc discharges the patient. And the next day, the RPR comes back 1 to 128, and the TPPA is reactive. Whoops. Yeah. Back to you, Sue. Did I skip a slide? Nope. Okay. Sure. So thank you. And I, I think uh, all of you are, are familiar with um, uh, syphilis serologies and the trials and tribulations therein. But just to review for a moment. Um, so when we're looking, when we're looking to make the diagnosis of syphilis, uh, and then certainly neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, et cetera, a uh, very important part of that diagnosis is the serologies. And uh, serologies come in two flavors. They come in the treponemal test, so things like the TPPA, the TPHA, things like that, the FTA. Uh, and then they come in uh, the other flavor, which is the non-treponemal test, uh, the RPR or VDRL. And the uh, FTA, uh, the TPPA, those treponemal tests, those essentially go up uh, and stay up for life. So once positive, they're always positive. And they don't come reported with a titer. Um, the RPR or VDRL, in contrast, uh, come with a titer, one to one, one to two, one to four, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, those go up and down with treatments and with time. And in fact, they are what you track to make sure that your treatment worked. You want to see an appropriate fourfold decline, um, say from one to 32 to one to eight in the appropriate time interval if the, anti if the antibiotics are working. And you also track this to see if a patient could have been reinfected, uh, because if they have that fourfold uh, increase uh, that's sustained, perhaps they've had a reinfection with syphilis. Um, but remember uh, that in uh, very early syphilis, these are antibodies. So just like any antibody, it takes time to develop. And very early on in primary syphilis, it's possible to have a false negative because the antibodies just haven't had a chance to develop yet. So the RPR is about 60 to 75% sensitive in primary syphilis. Treponemal tests tend to go positive a little bit earlier, um, but again, they're not perfectly sensitive. Um, so you can see here in the yellow line and the, and the light blue line, these are treponemal tests. They go up uh, shortly after uh, infection and they stay up essentially for life. Whereas the RPR, uh, sorry, whereas the RPR or the VDRL go down and they can go down with treatment or with time. So the RPR can actually even become non-reactive just with time in an untreated patient. Uh, but they still may need to be treated uh, for syphilis. All right, next slide, please. Back, thank you. Um, so, uh, so I think you are all uh, familiar with uh, the screening algorithms to diagnose syphilis um, uh, via serologies, uh, and I won't belabor these too much. Um, the traditional algorithm starts with the RPR, and then you confirm that with a treponemal test. Um, if the treponemal test is positive and the RPR is positive, then everything agrees and they have syphilis, but then you've just got to figure out based on the titers and their former treatments, um, if they need uh, treatment again, uh, if they need treatment um, or, uh, or if they've been adequately treated in the past. And then if the TPPA is negative, uh, more likely to be a, a false positive RPR. Now, more recently, many uh, labs are moving to the reverse sequence algorithm where a treponemal test is done first. Um, so something often like the EIA, the CIA, and then uh, you get an RPR um, if that's positive to confirm it. If the RPR is positive, then the algorithm stops there. And similarly, they've got syphilis either past or present. You've got to figure out uh, whether they need treatment. 
If the RPR is negative, then it goes to a tiebreaker, essentially different treponemal test, usually something like a TPPA. And uh, if that's positive, then uh, they have syphilis. Uh, you have to kind of figure out, um, is that RPR non-reactive because they've been adequately treated in the past? Or uh, do they still need treatment? If the TPPA is negative, then, um, then syphilis is unlikely. Though remember, again, if uh, they're at high risk for syphilis, they could be in sort of that, I guess you could call it almost a window period early on before antibodies have a chance to develop. So you may want to repeat uh, the serologies in two to four weeks. Next slide. All right, so back to you, Dr. Jacobson. Yeah, so the lumbar puncture returns the next day. She has 57 white cells, a protein of 90. The VDRL is pending. You call the patient and advisor, uh, you know, based on labs uh, and her clinical history that there's significant enough information to diagnose her with neurosyphilis and likely ocular syphilis. And you want her to go back to the hospital for IV penicillin. However, they told her she didn't have neurosyphilis or ocular syphilis, so she doesn't want to go back. Okay, back to you, Sue. Sue? Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I think this is uh, just a uh, uh, a slide revisiting sort of what we talked about already, um, that uh, neurosyphilis diagnosis is uh, a little bit complicated, um, that the CSF VDRL is highly specific but not sensitive. Um, CSF pleocytosis is actually the most sensitive test, but it's not very specific. Um, and, uh, and then elevation of the CSF protein um, is something to consider, though it's not the most specific test. Um, now, we can remember, I think we made this point um, with the other slides, but some persons with late neurosyphilis may have a negative serum uh, non-treponemal test. Next slide. I think this is you, Kathy. Yeah. So what is the treatment for neuroocular or otic syphilis? It's aqueous crystalline penicillin G, 18 to 24 million units per day, administered three to four million units every four hours. And um, the patient should get this uh, treatment for anywhere from 10 to 14 days. The one thing to be aware of when treating for neuroocular or otic syphilis, if your patient is also diagnosed with late latent syphilis, uh, the patient is getting anywhere from 10 to 14 days of penicillin, but the treatment for late latent syphilis is um, recommended to be 21 days. So some, but not all providers will give anywhere from one to three IM injections of the uh, LA, the Bicillin LA injection to ensure that the patient gets a full 21 days of coverage of penicillin. Sorry, they just, Slides don't advance that easily. So I have to click on them and then advance them. So my apologies for the delay between them. So unfortunately, our patient never goes to the ED. You convince her to come back to the clinic and you discuss the need for treatment. She refuses to go to the ED despite this discussion, but she tells you she's willing to get treatment if she can come into clinic for treatment. Are there any alternatives for neuroocular or otic syphilis treatment that you could give as an outpatient? And in fact, there are, uh, there are, um, you can use procaine penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM once daily, plus probenicid 500 milligrams orally four times a day, and give both of those for 10 to 14 days. Um, another alternative is ceftriaxone, one to two grams daily, either IM or IV for 10 to 14 days. But currently the data on ceftriaxone is based on a retrospective chart review um, and not based on a randomized clinical uh, trial. So there's really limited data to support this, but in the retrospective review, patients did do equally as well with the uh, ceftriaxone one to two grams. Next slide. 
So our patient, two days later, you check in with the case manager to see how the patient is doing with her daily injections. You learn that the clinic refused to buy it because it costs too much and this insurance didn't approve it. So you quickly get on the phone with insurance and explain the reason why the patient needs the medications. She's at risk for losing her vision, at risk for death. And you explain to the clinic leadership why it's important that they purchase this medication for her. Uh, she finally gets the Procaine IM, takes it for a few days, and then disappears. She shows back up to your clinic with describing blue-tinged vision and an eye that looks like this. Now, this is uveitis, and it's caused by a granulomatous precipitate, and patients um, experience sort of a blue tinge vision, but this is the result of increased intraocular hypertension, which can result in increased intraocular pressure. Um, and it's a, a, uh, a non-angle -ang closure intraocular hypertension, so it's unique. Um, and it's one of the reasons that ophthalmologists may make the diagnosis of uh, ocular syphilis in a patient. So back to the emergency room. This time you put her in an ambulance because you want to make sure she makes it there. You give her a dose of bicillin again because clearly her history has proven that she may not stay in the emergency room once she gets there and you want to cover her with something. She stays at the hospital for two days, gets IV aqueous penicillin, again leaves against medical advice after two days. She returns to clinic one week later and notes that her vision was better after the penicillin. And she agrees to finally take all of the 10 to 14 days of treatment. And she comes back to clinic one week later after taking that treatment and looks like this. And so now the question is, does the patient need any additional doses of the bicillin long acting? or does the patient need a follow-up CSF exam in six months? Sue? Yes, thank you. So I think a couple of additional uh, questions here. This one, I think Kathy already somewhat alluded to, but a uh, question of does she need additional doses of BPG after treatment for neurosyphilis? Now there's no known benefit to giving additional doses after the treatment of early neurosyphilis. Um, and there's, it's really not known whether additional doses of BPG improve outcomes in patients with late neurosyphilis, but there's a theoretical benefit. And essentially, uh, the idea is that we think we need to maintain uh, uh, treponemocidal levels of penicillin in the serum for at least 21 days in patients who have uh, uh, a late latent syphilis, so a longer duration of syphilis. Uh, there may be uh, some slowly replicating treponemes in there that take some time to really uh, get rid of. And so the idea is, as Kathy was saying, the treatment for neurosyphilis is 10 to 14 days. That's not quite covering the full 21 days. Um, so a patient uh, with late neurosyphilis, certainly uh, it's a consideration to give them another uh, dose or two of BPG to, con to complete that 21 day course. I'm not sure if you had other thoughts about that, uh, Kathy. No, I think this patient's history clearly supports the benefit of those added doses. Okay, so we'll go, yeah, let's go to the next slide. All right, and I think another question is, does this patient need follow-up CSF examinations after neurosyphilis treatment? Um, and so uh, to be clear, um, there's, uh, it's not recommended in the guidelines. Um, for uh, to have a follow-up LP six months after the diagnosis and treatment of neurosyphilis in patients who are uninfected, HIV uninfected, or people with HIV who are on effective antiretroviral therapy, as long as they're improving clinically and their serologic titers are responding appropriately. Uh, because we have data to suggest that in these individuals, uh, serologic titers responding appropriately uh, is pretty good at predicting uh, appropriate response to neurosyphilis as well. However, um, the study suggests that for people with HIV who are not on ART, 
that predictive relationship may not be as strong. And so it is recommended to consider a follow-up CSF exam at six months following treatment for neurosyphilis to really make sure that they're responding appropriately to therapy. Um, remember, uh, the antibiotics do part of the job in, in killing the treponeme, killing the organism, but the immune system has to kick in too and do some of the job. And so with people who are really very, uh, potentially very immunosuppressed, uh, we do have uh, additional concerns and so want to be potentially a little more careful. Next slide. So uh, I think that sort of concludes our talk, um, but here's a summary uh, of some of the key points. So syphilis is on the rise. I hope we've convinced you of that. And with it, neuroocular and otic syphilis. It's very critical not to miss neuroocular otic syphilis. So ask uh, patients with syphilis about symptoms, um, conduct thorough exams in patients with syphilis, and do an LP in those who have syphilis and neurologic symptoms, also in those who have tertiary syphilis, uh, potentially in those uh, who, are, who have a concern for uh, treatment failure, so patients who uh, have syphilis with signs or symptoms that persist or recur and they weren't reinfected, and uh, patients with a sustained fourfold increase in titer without concern for reinfection. Uh, patients with ocular syphilis or suspected of having ocular syphilis need an exam with ophthalmology ASAP. Uh, within 24 hours, this is an emergency. They can lose their sight. It's really critical. Um, if you suspect neuroocular otic syphilis, uh, as you can see, it can be a very difficult course. Um, so advocate for your patients. Uh, it can seem like uh, so many factors are conspiring against you, uh, but it's really important uh, uh, to, to uh, protect your patient's health and advocate. Uh, normal CSF does generally rule out neurosyphilis, uh, except tabes dorsalis, uh, that small percentage, about 10% but can be completely normal in ocular or otic syphilis. So a normal CSF does not rule out ocular or otic syphilis. And the treatment for neurosyphilis, ocular, and otic syphilis is really the same. It's aqueous uh, IV penicillin G, um, uh, 18 to 24 million units, uh, Q4 hours given for 10 to 14 days. Um, alternatives do include, though they're, they're quite, uh, uh, difficult to give because they have to be, they involve a, an injection essentially given every single day, but there are alternatives, including IM procaine penicillin plus, plus probenicid, or uh, potentially uh, ceftriaxone given either IM or IV for 10 to 14 days. So I think we'll stop there. Um, thank you so much for your attention, uh, and we'd be happy, I think, to take questions if that's okay with you, Elizabeth. I am okay with questions. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah, and I and I'm hoping that I can. Um, you know, we have we have a ton of good questions. First, thank you for that incredibly thorough and in depth presentation. I loved how you tied it back to the patient. I think that that really um, does speak to the clinical significance of the pathophysiology that you presented. Um, so why don't I? Start, why don't I start with some clinical questions because I know we have a lot of clinicians on the line. One that I think is a pretty interesting question is it's kind of a clinical scenario um, where, and I would pose this to both of you, I'm curious what, I, what both of you would do, um, where you have a patient who has syphilis and the, the symptoms that they're presenting, whether they're visual or otic, are these kind of more vague sub- you know, like kind of subacute or kind of chronic visual changes that you might see, oh yeah, my vision has been a kind a little blurry for the past year, something like that. So the history isn't isn't lining up as um, acutely as you would think. Um, and you know, if you wanted to refer them to an ophthalmologist or ENT, they're not readily available. Um, in that situation, would you would you go ahead and do the LP? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, um, you know, clinically, one of the things I find is it's always helpful to really sit down with the patient and try to understand, you know, has, has this visual problem that maybe you've had for a year or two, has it changed recently? And so can you tell me in the last month, in the last two weeks, in the last week, if you've seen any 
new changes. Um, that said, um, if this is a new diagnosis of syphilis and there's some ocular concern, you know, nobody is gonna wrong you for doing an LP, but if you don't do it and you miss it, people probably will. So, but although I guess I'm, I'm, I'm it, <laughs> one last, one last thought here, which is, you know, if it's, if you think that the person has true ocular syphilis, you actually, and, and no signs of neurosyphilis, you actually don't need that LP, which is newer with the new guidelines. Um, so uh, if you feel confident that you have ocular syphilis, the, uh, you don't necessarily need that LP. Um, referring to an ophthalmologist, if you have one, that's experience. Part of the, part of the purpose of this case was to show you that when you have inexperienced um, specialists, they may not also recognize uh, syphilis. And this was a true case. It was not a made up case. It really did happen. And, and, it, and you know, some of it continued for even longer, but we decided to uh, <laughs> shorten it so that, uh, you know, we could make our points and not drag it on too long. But uh, the, I think it is uh, important that the person you're referring them to also has some uh, experience so that they hopefully recognize those subtle signs. Uh, Sue, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Yeah, I know, I think it's just difficult, right? Because uh, when you ask about symptoms, sometimes they're just very vague things. There are also those people that whatever symptom you ask about, they seem to have. Right. Um, so well, now that you that can, yeah. right, that can be often a little, you know, anyway, that's, I guess, just the art of taking a history. Um, so I, I think it's difficult. Uh, I, I, I obviously, um, if the patient doesn't uh, truly only has sort of ocular or otic symptoms, they don't actually need the LP. But um, if there is, I agree with Kathy, I think if there's a particular change or you don't have a good other explanation uh, for their symptoms, I think that's really uh, one of the key parts. There's not a good other, you know, readily available, clear other explanation. I think you should always have a very uh, high index of suspicion in a person with a new syphilis diagnosis um, and uh, try to get them uh, to see an ophthalmologist. If you have to, as uh, Kathy had to do with this patient, send them to the emergency room. Um, because again, uh, it may be nothing, but uh, the consequences of missing it are potentially severe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think and... the other thing, I think the one other thing I would say is that um, as Kathy did, uh, you know, we all know that we ask a person to go to the ED or we ask a person to go to a specialist and uh, somewhere in the middle, they may get lost. Um, and so uh, making sure that uh, even if you're suspecting they have ocular syphilis and they are gonna need treatment for ocular syphilis, still giving them, uh, uh, at least initiating the treatment um, for uh, primary syphilis or for um, later syphilis, if that's what you suspect with uh, getting at least a dose of the benzathine penicillin G in may at least give them some coverage though it's not gonna be adequate if they truly have ocular syphilis. Thank you. And, um, and actually your answer connects to two questions that um, other people have asked. Um, one is actually kind of a, a clinical question that's just more nitty gritty, but it's worth putting out there, um, which is one, uh, one webinar uh, attendee wrote that um, they have gotten BIC LA rather than have the 1.2 in two doses and you have actually two injections, one in each glute, um, their clinic received four milliliters of the full 2.4. And there's a, and I'm bringing this up because I think a lot of people on the call might be dealing with this too. Do patients tolerate a single injection of four milliliters um, of the BIC or do you think it really needs to be broken up in two? And is there anything that you can do to kind of alleviate the discomfort if you are gonna give 2.4 in one shot? Yeah, it's a good question. I've, I've worked in clinics that have done both. They've either um, given the two separate doses or they have the full dose. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm, Blanking on the name, you can give an, a you know a minor injection of uh, lidocaine. Lidocaine, or you can use a. I mean, it's really the it's the bolus that they feel the discomfort from. You you can do that, but 
you know, what we always tell our patients is the injection of the lidocaine is probably going to hurt as much as yeah. getting the bolus. And so you're probably better off just getting the bolus, but there's going to be those patients out there that are going to want that lidocaine beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah. I've heard, I've heard techniques. Project. Yeah. It's not, it's not fun. I've heard techniques where you like kind of really want to hold the, um, hold the tissue when you inject and that can help or ice beforehand, but um, you know. Okay, um, moving back to emergency departments. This is another question, um, uh, Dr. Tuttingham, that your answer led to, which is what do you do if either the emergency department just simply doesn't follow the recommendations um, and slash or, um, if the emergency department doesn't have the ability to do the LP. Um, clinically, have you come across that? How do you handle that? Um, I think I'll leave that to Kathy because she clearly had a lot of adventures. With yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, that's Kathy, what do you what do you do in those situations? Yeah, so I've worked in clinics where we do the LP in clinic. I've worked in clinics like that, where in order to get an LP, you have to send them to the emergency room. And in fact, in this very patient, there was one emergency room who said they can't do the LP, that we would have to send them to a neurologist to get the LP. So there's the full spectrum out there of what you can and can't do. If you're comfortable doing an LP in your clinic, you can do it. We did those routinely um, in one clinic that I worked at, LA County. So, you know, we had large numbers of patients, um, but it really depends on your comfort level. Um, but the, the ultimate alternative is actually to refer them to a neurologist because most neurologists will do LPs if that's the only option you have. Okay. Um, okay, now I have a question. Um, this, I would, like, I would like to hear Dr. Tuttingham's thoughts first. So Sue, um, why isn't there a DNA test for syphilis? <laughs> <laughs> why can't we just draw someone's blood and do a gnat and why not? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I think it, it sort of feeds into the overall question of why don't we have better tests for syphilis in general? I really yeah. wish we did because we're still using what we used uh, decades, if not hundreds of years ago. Um, so, uh, but, but anyway, I think one of the issues, so, so there are some, um, nucleic acid amplification tests that are that some people are trying to develop for use on other tissues like oral um, or other tissues, uh, not necessarily on a blood draw. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and certainly there have been attempts to do uh, uh, PCRs in the blood, but syphilis, um, you know, while it disseminates quickly is relatively low in burden most of the time in the blood. Um, perhaps the highest burden uh, would be in secondary syphilis. But most patients, um, you know, are not in that in that window, and so it's hard to detect. And many of these uh, nucleic acid amplification tests that people are trying to develop or have developed just aren't very sensitive. Um, uh, and again, I think part of it is because of that sort of low burden of actual treponemes. It's a, it's very different from a lot of other bacteria, right? It's slow to uh, replicate. Um, overall, it's a relatively uh, low number of organisms. And I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's really one of the big challenges is trying to do some sort of gnat. Um, if you have a, if you have an actual lesion like a shanker, um, there are some homegrown like PCRs uh, that can be done on those, and that's not so bad because you have something that's really teeming with spirochetes. But just like a blood test or something, I wish we had it, uh, but uh, but we don't. Yeah, I think um, that is. If I could wish for something, that would be a big one. That would be pretty high up there, a definitive test. Um, Dr. Jacobson, do you have any additional thoughts to that? Nothing, uh, you know, really scientific to add to that. Thanks, Sue. That was a great uh, summary. My only hope is that with all the advances that have happened with COVID, that there's many more companies out there now that are uh, developing tests that my hope is that they you know, really can put their brains together and, and find a better test for us. Yeah. Um, okay, next is a, uh, I actually have um, a question for Dr. Jacobson, um, which pertains to epidemiology. One attendee asked, 
if there was any data on transgender or non-binary rates of syphilis or neurosyphilis, um, and if that is something that is in the pipeline for surveillance, if not, um, and if you can comment a little bit about that. Yeah, those are excellent questions. And, and we're looking at our uh, data for STD control branch in California across all of our data to start to try to uh, capture that data more readily so that we're able to make some of those uh, determinations as far as how certain uh, populations are impacted. So it, it's an idea that's in the works and there's a group of folks at the SED control branch that have been working on it and definitely important. The other um, piece that's important is really using uh, California has a healthy places index where we look at um, uh, individuals that are at greater risk for having poor outcomes and applying the healthy places index uh, to syphilis. And in fact, we have a recent publication about that. I'm um, seeing that most of our um, syphilis cases occurred in uh, zip codes where uh, they had poor uh, outcomes clinically based on their healthy places index. Great. Um, thank you. Okay, I'm looking through our through our things. I have a couple interesting um, couple interesting questions that are clinical questions. The first is um, whether you can see tertiary manifestations in someone who also has primary syphilis. And um, be before you answer, it, for the audience, the reason that I think that this is interesting is because. When we think about syphilis and we think about primary syphilis, that's typically a, a localized infection that hasn't disseminated yet. Um, and when we think about secondary tertiary syphilis, these are things once the treponine has disseminated. So if somebody already has syphilis that has advanced to tertiary disease, are they also susceptible to develop a chancre if they get exposed again? Um, so I'm curious, what our presenters think about that. Yeah, so I guess I would be curious what Kathy thinks as well. But so I think um, definitely you can have overlap uh, in the early stages of syphilis, right? In fact, we had this example patient had that. Um, so uh, that patient had both uh, a sh had shankers actually of uh, primary syphilis plus had neuro and ocular syphilis at the same time. Uh, and actually that's something that is potentially a little more common in, uh, in very immunosuppressed individuals with HIV, uh, which this patient was. Um, so that was a little bit of, I think one of the points um, that, uh, that we could hopefully make with that case. Um, so certainly, um, you can have uh, manifestations of primary syphilis that overlap with uh, the, the other early manifestations, um, including things like secondary syphilis or neurosyphilis, um, ocular syphilis, those kinds of things. Um, as to whether uh, you would have uh, an overlap with tertiary syphilis, so I, at least the teaching that I've seen um, is that uh, if you haven't been treated for syphilis and so you've developed uh, tertiary syphilis, and it's not that you have, um, that you actually had developed tertiary syphilis and we're just seeing some late manifestation that hasn't completely gone away after treatment. Um, so, you know, say you had, I don't know what you had, but maybe you had an aortic aneurysm that had already started and then you got antibiotics for something else and really ultimately got treated. So you don't have syphilis anymore really, but that, that manifestation is still there because that bulging just doesn't go away. Um, uh, so unless that's the case, my understanding is that if you still have syphilis and it hasn't been treated, then you're not really susceptible to a new infection. Um, so I would find that surprising, but, uh, but I'd be happy to hear what Kathy thinks about that as well. Yeah. Um, so scientifically, I think what you're saying is correct, but my entire career, 30 years is, has been caring for HIV patients. And I think when you care for significantly immune suppressed patients with CD4 counts below uh, 10 or 20, whose viral loads are sometimes in the millions, all the science goes out the window and you can see primary, uh, secondary, tertiary syphilis, you know, together. So it, I think it's just the immune suppression uh, issue can play a big role. And so, uh, 
yes, from a science standpoint, what you're saying is correct, but clinically, the ball game changes when you're talking about end-stage AIDS patients. I think that's an important point, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and actually speaking of that, so this, is, this brings up an interesting point and also something someone asked, um, which is when you look at patients who do d develop neurosyphilis, um, you know, I think that uh, we do tend to see an association between people who are living with HIV and those who go on to develop neurosyphilis or neuroinvolvement. Um, would you say that that's also true for other groups, like people who use drugs, people who are unstably housed, et cetera? And I realize that like social determinants of health often are overlapping. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts about neurosyphilis in relation to different populations at risk? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'd love to hear what Kathy thinks. Um, I, I think that, um, I think the question about neurosyphilis in terms of who's most susceptible um, probably has to do, I guess, scientifically with two things. So one would be, again, the state of the immune system. And so um, uh, we don't have much in the way of data, as you might imagine on uh, say, the rates of neurosyphilis uh, happening in transplant patients or something uh, right. for, for reasons that you can imagine. Um, but, uh, but I think that uh, patients who are truly immunosuppressed for various reasons, that would be a reason for them to have more neurosyphilis. The other thing that I think has been sort of raised on a few occasions, um, uh, which is, this is sort of an indirect uh, answer to your question, but there have, been, there have been questions about whether there are certain strains of syphilis that may be more neurotropic or more oculotropic or, uh, uh, you know, just have a different characteristic. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, when we saw a, a sort of a, a bunch of cases of ocular syphilis uh, that were sort of cropping up a few years ago and the CDC put out um, the MMWR and sort of uh, notified people of, uh, of uh, this increase in ocular syphilis cases that we were seeing, uh, there were some researchers from University of Washington who tried to compile some of those strains and see if they were different and see if there was anything that seemed to be more oculotrophic that would make them more likely to cause ocular syphilis. And they really couldn't find anything, um, but I think uh, theoretically it's possible that there are certain strains that are a little more prone to do that. And so if they're circulating in a certain population, maybe you might see that uh, association even in patients who aren't uh, overtly immunosuppressed. But that's more of a theoretical um, question. Uh, I, I think ultimately it probably has to do more with immunosuppression than anything else. Yeah, and just to add to what you're saying, I think what we don't really know is when individuals go on bingers, for example, and they're using day after day after day, does that in and of itself actually cause some level of immune suppression, the drugs themselves? I don't think we know the answer to that, but I'm suspic suspicious it might. Um, in addition to that, if you think about what's happened with COVID, um, I will not be surprised at all if we begin to see increasing uh, cases of, you know, neuroocular otic syphilis in patients who have recently had a COVID case because COVID is basically, uh, you know, what it does to T cells uh, and the immune system is very similar to what happens with HIV, but it happens on a shortened time frame. So what in, happens in HIV in two years happens in two weeks to the T cells, et cetera, in, um, in COVID. And so I think one of the interesting things that we need to do is actually cross-reference our databases with uh, syphilis and COVID and see if we see increases in neuroocular um, or otic syphilis in those cases. Of course, it would be great if, if uh, we had better surveillance for neuroocular and otic syphilis. So then when we cross-reference that, we would feel even uh, you know, better about uh, the data we find. But, but I think that that might be an interesting thing for us to look at uh, and something that we're gonna look at in California, certainly. Well, with that note of looking forward, I think it's, um, and also noticing that it is 12.59, unfortunately, because we have about 20 more amazing questions. Um, um, but I wanna thank you both. This has been wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed it. And 
Thank you to all of our attendees. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it as well. If you have any issues and you need to get in touch with the CAPTC, uh, once again, our manager is elizabeth.olson at captc.org. Uh, excuse me, at, at uh, ucsf.edu. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, and I want to thank you both Dr. Cuttingham and Dr. Uh, Jacobson. Uh, so I hope everyone has a great, a great rest of your afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.